All right, welcome back everybody to How To Happy Hour. It's a special edition of How To Happy Hour today. It is that time of year where it's seasons freezings and we have a special guest, Jake Cohen. Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be it's here. Good to, ha good to have you back. You've been, uh, you're, you're a repeat guest we have. So uh, this will this will be great. Uh, this we'll much regular. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this special edition of How To Happy Hour, uh, this is, uh, we're happening at 9.30 in the morning for all you early risers here on the West Coast, but maybe midday for folks on the East Coast of the United States uh, here on Twitch. If uh, you stumbled upon us on YouTube or some other platform, go ahead and find us over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash pagerduty and give us a subscribe so you can be aware of all these fun episodes and shows that we have here on the Pager Duty Twitch channel. If you want to get a hold of us, if there's certain things you want to see on the show, things that uh, you want to know how to how to essentially, so we can talk about here and how to happy hour, uh, give us a, a, send us an email over at community team at pagerduty.com, or you can reach out to us on the community forums at community.pagerduty.com, or you can find me on Twitter at stmcallister.com or Mandy Walls at LNX chk i think on twitter uh as well i know it's linux chick i can't remember if it's chck i think i'm pretty sure it's chk so um but uh either way you can you can uh, get a hold of us there and uh, let us know what you need on on the on the show as mentioned this is that special time of year where you know things are frozen not only outside, even here in Seattle, Washington, which is crazy because we don't usually ever freeze, but apparently we like to this year, uh, but also your code and your changes, your infrastructure, things are going to be frozen in place at least for the next few weeks, right, through the holiday season. And so we here at PagerDuty uh, like to take advantage of that opportunity that you have some extra time to maybe think about some things that uh, you maybe uh, were putting off because you were working on prod, but now prod is frozen. And so you want to learn about some new things. I was talking to a friend yesterday, actually, and uh, he's a developer educator at a company called Sweetwater. And uh, he's going to be on our podcast here in the next few weeks. And he talked about how leading up to Black Friday, the six weeks before Black Friday, there's like no education going on because they want their engineers to be heads down on what they're doing. However, after Black Friday and up until, say, you know, middle, early January, Everybody's working still because it's important that everything stays up and running, but there are no changes. And so they, you know, they have, they have code freezes. As we learned from Rich Lafferty on the last Twitch session, that we call them change freezes because there's so many pieces of our infrastructure that were that were that are involved in our applications, not just code, but various pieces that we also need to not change. And so during that time is actually a great time. For them to educate engineers, educate developers, find out about new topics, new things. And so we here at PageDuty want to talk a little bit about automation uh, during this uh, season's freezings. While, you, while your prod is frozen, we're going to help share some knowledge with you to help you run things a little bit more efficiently and uh, be able to essentially keep things running, make sure that uh, you, you, uh, your incidents are remediated as fast as possible, but also just so that you can remove toil from work. And so that way you can actually focus on the things you want to focus on, focus on the things that are creative, unique, that make you unique and leave the, leave the, you know, the repeatable things, the things that can be automated to automation. So you can fill out the run deck survey there on survey monkey at the link that you see there. If you want to uh, see what, see what you, uh, have there and what we have there as far as the the survey for run deck and what you want to see in or what you're doing with your with your automation and then also we have some uh blog posts that we'll drop in the chat there uh that i think jake and i are going to be talking about a little bit here going forward in in the episode today so as mentioned jake is a repeat guest uh, jake just for the folks who haven't met you yet uh wanted to introduce yourself and tell us what you do at, at pager duty Sure thing. Everyone, uh, I'm Jake Cohen. Uh, I'm on the product management team for the process automation product suite here at PagerDuty. And so I work on our content solutions and integrations built on top of the core platform. Yeah. And uh, so Jake is, uh, he's heavily involved with our, with our automation piece, with the piece of 
pager duty that you was formerly known as run deck and uh but uh, affectionately known as automated actions and also what was the other one there's automated actions that's that's in the cloud and then there's the one on that's on prem right, process got, automation uh, yeah exactly process automation yeah. on prem and the cloud version of that which is runbook automation and what gets you excited about automation jake i mean the the thing that that uh as I've learned more about it, as I've seen Rundeck kind of come into PagerDuty and folks uh, bringing that story of how, you know, when we respond to incidents, when we're working with our infrastructure and our different systems, there's there's a lot of repeated tasks. There's a lot of, a lot of repeated things that we do uh, that is tedious, to lack for a better word. It's it's mistake prone? I mean, what are, what are some reasons why you just get super excited about automation? Well, I certainly think you listed a couple of them in terms of the ability to reduce toil, reduce repeated tasks, reduce mundane tasks, and put uh, security and structure around things that uh, are error prone if they're manual. Uh, in addition to that, what really gets me excited about uh, the type of automation that, that PagerDuty promotes is the ability to disseminate technical expertise and domain expertise across individuals and across teams. Uh, a lot of times the, uh, the tribal knowledge and the domain expertise will stay within a, a, a person's head or in a small cohort of people. And it's hard to get that knowledge out to other people to empower them to do more on their own or to speed up the onboarding of new people. Uh, which is maybe one of the things we'll talk about with with diagnostics when it comes to being on call. But uh, you know, that's a flavor of automation that I think uh, Rundeck and and PagerDuty process automation do really really well. So true. And when you think about it, it, it reminds me of that that line that people say: "No one person knows all the things about all the things." Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and there there isn't. And a lot of times, especially as software engineers, uh, when I was an engineer full time, you would you would kind of feel like, "Oh, I got to know everything about this system and like every way how to fix everything and, and make sure that if there's something happens that I can do that." But you know, the everybody's got their own areas of expertise. And so by automating what people know, so if I know a little bit more about, say, databases than someone else, I can say, oh, well, I can automate these pieces of, of say, when an incident happens. And so I, I love that idea that it's a collective or a collection of, of the, well, the, the collective knowledge, I guess, a collection of collective knowledge. It's too many times of a collective, isn't it? But, uh, so, but essentially, like bringing in that knowledge together, that way we're all like our, our, our value has all raised. And so that's, that's a great thought. Yeah. And the, and the knowledge capture, right. To, to safeguard the, the team or the organization against uh, people moving to, to different teams or moving in and out of the company. Uh, you know, all engineers are guilty of not documenting enough of their knowledge in, uh, in what? confluence or wikis. <laughs> I'm no. as guilty as that as anyone. And, uh, <laughs> but, well, you know, what, what uh, again, I can speak to just in personal experience and, and with the engineers that I've worked with is that they are and we are more likely to write a script than we are to document what that script does or document the manual equivalent of that script. Uh, and so if we can uh, capture what that automation does, what that script does in a tool like ours, then we've not only disseminated knowledge to others on the team currently, but uh, we've we've averted some risk if that individual happens to leave the team or the organization. So what is the difference? What is the difference between like, so if I, I and, and I don't know what you're talking about, all of my code is just <laughs> totally self-documented. So I don't know what, what, you're, what you're saying there, but what's the difference between writing a script and then automating in a tool like something with like, in that PagerDuty provides? Sure, so um, a script is the, what we may, may, might call the, the raw material of the automation, that, that uh, basic unit of, of automation. Uh, it is what is uh, automating the, the, the specific task, but uh, it is a, a raw goods material of automation. And so it, it maybe it lives on GitHub uh, so you might have some some shared visibility into it and some 
uh, some version control there. But when it comes to actually using that automation, there it almost always is a lack of standardization and security around how that piece of automation is invoked and uh, how it uses credentials, how it law, how it is logged, how uh, it is used across members uh, who didn't who didn't write it. I mean, the the quintessential example here is if I have a, a Python script and I send it to someone who is not as well versed in Python as as I am, um, and I I slack them. Hey, you know, you're gonna use these input parameters when you invoke it uh, with these you know these uh, invocation flags, uh, if they happen to get one of those wrong, then you've you've invoked automation with a, you know, a wrong input parameter that could wreak havoc uh, and cause more damage than uh, actually using the automation itself. And so uh, what we what we provide is a is a you can call it a wrapper, but it's more of a, uh, a platform for those those standards and guardrails and being able to delegate that automation to others. So it, it can can tie into automation of all types, whether it is a script or an Ansible playbook or that sort of thing, uh, and, and cover those other layers to using automation in, in an organization that you won't get with just the raw goods themselves. So like taking the collective knowledge of everyone and giving it boundaries, right? Like making sure that it stays within the guardrails of, so it doesn't, hopefully it doesn't hurt things. Uh, and so that, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, with with automated diagnostics, so that when I think of automation first, I think of something in place like like you said with a script. If I have a script, it's gonna like fix something for me, right? I, mm -hmm. Usually, if I think of automation, it's it's to remediate something. But where does automation uh, diagnostics fit into that whole play and that whole workflow? Sure. So it's it's very similar in that what we're doing with. Uh, diagnostics is emulating what a an expert responder would do when they get paged for that particular incident type or alert type. And just as uh, a responder or an expert responder knows that there's a, a quick fix or a band-aid fix uh, when it comes to restarting a service or adding compute resources or storage resources or doing a, a rollback or a failover, uh, responders, especially tenured ones, know that they have a common list of things that they do for diagnosing the issue and for investigating uh, where to where to really dig in and debug uh, and help them uh, figure out what is this uh, issue not due to. Uh, you know, help, they, they have their initial things that they check to know which teams to pull in or which individuals to to escalate to. And so it's the, it's a similar concept, which is let's emulate what the expert first responders do, um, perhaps across multiple teams, uh, in, and and therefore reduce the number of people that need to get pulled in uh, for an incident. So it's it's very similar, but it has more to do with the the initial stages of of the incident. I I heard it described, and maybe it was you that described it, but it it's. Uh... It, it, it solves the problem of knowing where to start, mm -hmm. right? Like that it, that it basically says here, this is happening. By the way, it's like, a, it's like an assistant coming up to you saying, okay, well, this is happening. And here are all the reports on the different things we think it's where we see something going wrong or, or this, here, here's the status of all the systems essentially. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And uh, again, back to uh, that dissemination of knowledge, you know, I was talking with a, a customer recently who was expounding upon, you know, their, when they have a new engineer and it's their first time being on call, there is that real, that real fear of, okay, well, what happens when I, if I get paged and I have no idea where to start, I have no idea what this, you know, 503 error on a load balancer means or what you know where to start looking at it um where, where to start looking and investigating it and so the the hope is that again those more tenured engineers yeah can can provide some some guidance some programmatic guidance on well this is what we would where we would start to look when we would get a a load balancer incident for example 
I'd be terrified personally, right? For that, for that, for that exact reason. Cause it's like, I know my area, but like if something outside my area happens or some weird thing happens and like the whole system comes down, which, you know, we're all engineers. Those of us who has been engineers, we know how that feels, right? It's right. happened to all of us. Right. Uh, but it's terrifying because it's like, I, especially in the moment where everything's on fire, mm -hmm. you're, you're, what you do know when things aren't on fire totally changes when things are on fire because it's like you can't even remember your own name at that point. Right. And right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and you, especially if you, uh, you know, quick little pager duty plug. If you don't have pager duty and you're just getting um, bombarded by duplicate alerts that all are, have to do with the same incident, yeah. um, you know, pager duty is a good job of of grouping those so that you're not just getting blown up while you're trying to actually address the issue. Um, that doesn't help the anxiety and the uh, nope. overwhelming uh, feelings being on call and, and during an incident. And so, um, again, it comes back to whatever we can do to 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 ease that stress and ease that burden, uh, but also uh, provide guidance on where to start. And, uh, you know, the other common symptom we hear is that even with a great tool like PagerDuty that can group alerts and, and um, show you dependencies between services, um, it, there, there's still this common behavior of pulling in way more people that need to be pulled in during an incident. And so if we can, you know, interview those people, hey, what, what do you tend to do when you get pulled into an incident by the first responder? And then emulate those and surface those in a way that the first responder can, can comprehend, then we can maybe reduce the number of, of people that need to be uh, paged or even just a, um, you know, a Slack message during, during business hours is an interruption that costs the team and the business money. Yeah, not to, you know, that's not even saying talking about the times that you're going to page them not on business hours right. and uh, <laughs> how much, you know, and how much that costs, exactly. not only in, in business money, but just in like the morale of the people. I mean, a needless, needlessly getting woken up at three in the morning just to be like, oh, yeah, you want to do this is something yeah. you could have said, you know, during work hours, like you were saying, you collect it in right. an automated you know, workflow type thing or an automated action and then make it so that, uh, you know you can save yourself some, some times of getting woken up in the middle of the night. Exactly. So you've been on a few times, as I mentioned, talking about automation. What are some of the new things that have been happening with, with automation, automated, automated diagnostics that people could find inside the product? Sure. Uh, so the, the first uh, couple of things that I'll, I'll touch on are um, we now provide a, a library of pre-built automation out of the box for any new Runbook automation uh, customer. So if you get a new Runbook automation instance, you now have this pre-populated library of example jobs, as we call them. Uh, Wait, so we you... came up with those. We came up with those examples. Mm -hmm. Precisely. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and... Sorry. Keep going. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, and we've talked a little bit about that that library on a, on a prior call, but um, now we've we've just baked them into the product, and so you you can get up and running and uh, help them help spawn ideas of what would make sense in your environment with your infrastructure and services. Uh, we previously did talk a little bit about our progress badges, uh, how that helps uh, uh, simplify the verbose output of of diagnostic messages. Um, and so I just want to reiterate that, that that's a big goal of ours, which is, again, if, if I'm not an Elasticsearch expert and mm -hmm. the, the domain expert for Elasticsearch uh, provides me verbose diagnostics, I might not be able to make heads or tails of that, especially at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, and so uh, the progress badges. And then uh, uh, the next thing I'll touch on is uh, our what we call our solution guide, which is in addition to the uh, out-of-the-box jobs that we've written, uh, we have a whole solution guide with a lot of material. Uh, well, now, now it has a lot of material. So we recently revamped our, our solution guide that provides a long list of examples for uh, a variety of environment and infrastructure components and, and environment types. Um, and I can even screen share if that's all right. And we yeah, show, go what, for it. show what this looks like here. So uh, let me share a screen. I'm definitely more of a visual learner. Sure. And and I think we provided a, a link to this 
uh, or we will. Um, you sh can you see my screen? Let me just confirm that. I here. can't see your screen yet. It's uh, it's down at the bottom. There's a share screen. Stop sharing. Oh. All right, let's try that again. Oh yeah, you got to put it up in the thing, and then we add it to the we add it to the stream. So it's like a two stepper. Share screen. Yeah, and then add to stream. There we go. There Woo! we go. All right. There it is. So this is our uh, auto diagnostic solution guide, and in addition to helping get users set up and, and help them understand what it is and what they're going to get out of it. So I can make this a little bit bigger here. Uh, so these are the, uh, the, the uh, progress badges I was talking about to help simplify. Uh, that, okay. That I was going to ask about those. Cause like I was wondering with the badges people, but they're, it's like the status of a thing that they're checking right. on or whatever. Right, right. And so it's basically saying, so I don't have to be the elastic search expert. It's basically saying, don't worry, this one's okay. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Okay. Uh, and so again, if I'm a, if I'm a junior engineer, or I, again, I'm just not a domain expert in Kubernetes, uh, I can now say like, okay, there's something in the Kubernetes logs that the Kubernetes expert deems wrong, and, and therefore it's unhealthy. Um, it. So uh, that's the progress badges. And then what I was going to show, uh, and this is what it looks like in Slack. I mean, Fairly, fairly similar, but uh, nice and elegant there if you operate out of Slack during incidents. Uh, and we can revisit that in a second. But this is what I was going to uh, showcase right now, which is um, we put together this, in addition to the out-of-the-box jobs, we put together a library of uh, examples and best practices for all these different environment types. And so you can see here for AWS, we have common things that you might want to check, right? CloudWatch logs and, and uh, Elastic Load Balancer targets health. But... You know, if you're operating in Kubernetes and you're going to look at pod logs and Kubernetes events, and if you're working with databases and you're going to look at blocking logs and missing indexes. Uh, and with any one of these, I can I can go to, uh, we have a dedicated page for each one of these environment types or uh, components of your infrastructure stack and give you examples of what are the types of things that you would uh, look for and what are the types of uh, common symptoms that would lead to a metrics-based alert uh, in in your uh, monitoring and observability tools, and then we go into how we actually help you uh, diagnose diagnose those uh, those types of issues. And so you can see here the common like MySQL uh, command there. It's awesome. So not only we're taking the collective knowledge of the team internally, we're sharing the knowledge that we have that we've collected. Through our experience, people that we've talked to, our experiences we've had as you know, through our engineering life, uh, and sharing it with the with the with the community. That's awesome. Uh, exactly. For everyone watching, I dropped a link to this uh, document in the chat. You can find it there, uh, down there at the bottom. Great, great. So, and, and we're going to continue to build this out. Uh, we we want to make this as rich and uh, full a library as we can. Um, and and uh, again, I'll showcase kind of the the out of the box jobs that we've provided is now fairly extensive, fairly lengthy. And again, we're trying to cover as many of these different uh, infrastructure components as we can. And uh, and and this is to help you get up and running uh, as quickly as possible. Is also you know, spawn ideas for what might be relevant in in your environment. So these are provided out of the box, like someone comes in and they these will be there for them to say, these are the things we recommend in these certain areas. Exactly, exactly. Fantastic. I, I think it's just having having those resources really helps. I mean, and I, I keep going back to this same note and I play it a lot. We don't know all the things about all the things. And so it's like, you're a smart person, but you might not be smart. You might be brand new to a, you know, to Elasticsearch, like you were saying. And so having an area of like, at least knowing where to start and then going from there, uh, really, I, I think will make people's lives a lot, lot better. Yeah, hundred um, percent. What we, uh, another area that I did want to touch on that that um, is new for us and, and is a uh, definitely an area of, of investment in terms of uh, what we're going to build and develop as far as diagnostics goes is <clears throat> everything that we've spoken about when it comes to diagnostics, uh, for the most part, by and large, what we've spoken about is uh, helping triage, helping 
uh, responders during the incident, n n again, know where to start investigating, know whom to pull in, know who not to pull in, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but in addition to that, it's become very clear, and we have talked about this very briefly on another uh, Twitch stream, uh, this notion of capturing state during mm, an incident yeah. and capturing that so that even after the, ins the, the issue is resolved, you have evidence of what caused that issue in the first place. And this can manifest itself in a couple of ways. Uh, one way is you have those uh, what we call transitory or transitive alerts uh, where it, you know, an alert takes place and then it auto resolves itself uh, for, for this, that, or the other reason. Uh, and, you know, it, it might happen a number of times in, in a, a given, given period of time and uh, operations engineers and, and developers, they are trying to figure out what, what is causing that thing to, to give us a whole bunch of these, these incidents that just auto resolve. And uh, what we can do is use our auto-diagnostic solution to, to grab as much information as we can as soon as that incident is, is kicked off, as soon as that incident is triggered, and store it somewhere permanently so that when engineers have time to investigate it, they have that evidence. And uh, the, the other way that this can manifest itself is uh, there is an incident that uh, is not transitory, but uh, does involve hum does require human involvement, but there's a known band-aid fix for it, such as restarting a service or redeploying a pod. Uh, but we, we've, we've heard from engineers and developers is that a lot of times when that band-aid fix is applied, you lose evidence of what caused that issue in the first place. So if I redeploy a pod, I've lost the uh, the application state. So I've lost lost the you know thread and memory information of the application. Uh, I may lose the active queries against the database. And so uh, we did demonstrate this on a previous uh, Twitch stream, but we're gonna dig into this area a bit more because it's come up more and more with uh, customers is this uh, our ability to capture real debug level information uh, as soon as that, that incident occurs and, and store it somewhere. So um, the example that we showed on that prior stream was if I have a, a Java app in a Kubernetes pod and mm -hmm. it goes into uh, an alert state, we could immediately grab a, a thread dump of the Java app or memory dump and, and then send it to S3. Um, and that's what we demoed. And uh, it's become clear that, that that use case is more prevalent than than may, may have realized. Um, it was at AWS reInvent uh, two weeks ago. And uh, an engineer there said, you know, we get these tech debt tickets for issues that have come up sporadically. And mm -hmm. so we go to ops engineers and we ask them like, okay, well, do you have evidence of like what was going on around the time that this occurred? And they're like, oh yeah, no, well, we've got logs and we've got, you know, monitoring. And uh, that usually is not deep enough to mm -hmm. really point an engineer where to fix the code level or configuration level issues, the real root cause. And uh, so our ability to do this is, is something new uh, for, for these engineers, uh, and what we recently came across is that um, Kubernetes uh, released recently released a, a feature in their uh, most latest release of, of uh, Kubernetes that actually helps make this possible. But it, the way that it's been instrumented there is that it does require human involvement. So mm. our ability to to automate that real time debug in production in a safe way is is uh, really interesting. Uh, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because in the incident, your your whole purpose is trying to get things resolved as fast as possible. So you're when you get things fixed, you're not gonna you're not gonna have that state. And the thought that I had while you're talking about logs, it, logs is like or like documentation. When you, when you're writing code, it's like, oh yeah, I'll log this, I'll log that, whatever. But you don't realize that you didn't log the right thing until it's too late. And right. then you're, then you're looking at your logs like, we really want to see. Oh, but we're not logging that there. 
And so right. then you're, you're scratching your head. And so having that automation of, a, you know, just getting a memory dump, getting a, you know, seeing the heap essentially there than Java, then, uh, then you can see what's going on. Uh, that makes, yeah, that, that's really rad. So, uh, or, or like to your point, right, maybe the developer didn't log certain things or, uh, certain log streams are not being sent to the log aggregator to the log tool, just mm -hmm. because that, that, that level of, of, uh, fidelity and, in, in uh, data capture is, is really expensive. Uh, and, and so sometimes like application level logs exist, just they exist on the pod itself, right? <laughs> they exist yeah. uh, on the log file on the server itself. And so the only way to capture that is through uh, uh, debugging on, on the, the node uh, itself. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's a, uh, it's definitely an interesting, interesting conversation to say the least. For real. And so with that, the, Another use case you, you talk about in addition to capturing state is real-time up updates. Mm -hmm. so talk mm -hmm. about that. Talk about how automatic diagnostics fits in with real-time updates. Sure. So uh, when, when uh, during an incident, uh, it is very common, especially during uh, major incidents, there's uh, one of the roles of the incident commander uh, is to periodically get an update from those addressing the issue, uh, both for posterity purposes, again, to, to log what, you know, what's the status of things on, on the timeline for post-mortem, but also to send out that update to stakeholders and to relevant parties. Maybe it's to, you know, to customers to update your status page. Uh, and what uh, we found is uh, we can, we can, automate part of that uh, part of the process of being an incident commander as well, which is during an incident, if uh, we have those checks, those health checks for the different components of a given service or the, the full technology stack, then the retrieval of those health checks or those diagnostics doesn't need to be limited to just the creation of the incident. Uh, at the outset of the incident, whoever that incident commander is can can invoke the automated run book of the diagnostics whenever they would like during the incident. And so rather than needing to uh, ping everyone who's investigating and troubleshooting the issue and ask for, for a status update, I can click that button that, that you know, does you know, full component diagnostics and uh, get that update and, uh, and use that as my source of, of again, for the postmortem or for status updates for, for stakeholders uh, and, uh, you know, reduce, again, the interruptions to those who are actually addressing the issue. Uh, so so that, that's what the other you know, use case for, for diagnostics is, is during the incident itself, providing a real-time status update of, of the, the pieces of the puzzle being, being uh, attended to. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like it, my, my brain went back to those badges you were showing because mm -hmm. I can see those badges and I can communicate that to the, to stakeholders or can stakeholders right. see the badges too? It, it's like, so could, if I was connected to that through a business service or whatever, and I was a business stakeholder, could I see the, the status of those different things? Do we want that? Or do, is that something that I we have? I believe so. I believe stakeholders can see that. I, I've, I honestly have to check, but uh, yeah. whoever can see the incident timeline would be able to see that. Uh, but ultimately, if I'm a again, if I'm the incident commander, I can I can retrieve those those progress badges yeah. and then um, just ping a Slack channel where where the stakeholders are are following along uh, and and just let them know, hey, you know, we've we've addressed the the app level issue now we're just you know addressing the you know infrastructure level issue if it was you know, something load related uh so and i can even you know provide a visual for this real quick as oh, well oh yeah uh this one i think is pretty neat so let me uh let me do that as well here so i believe it's uh this one here so can you see the screen again uh add to screen okay there we go so here we're on the incident timeline and you can see that uh, at 9.17, this was uh, invoked and we had a you know, 
Kubernetes check was unhealthy. And then a couple minutes later, we ran it again and it was healthy. And then, uh, you know, maybe we ran it again just to confirm that our, our uh, remediation is, is lasting, right? It's, it's working. Yeah. As, as it wasn't expected. an anomaly kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, this is just, just another way to, to think about how there are parts of that incident process that are well-known defined processes. Uh, uh, re repeated tasks like asking the the responders for uh, an update, and uh, if we can if we can automate that, uh, we can we can uh, be more we can have more concrete uh, data. Uh, we can yeah. also again reduce the interruptions to those who are actually tending to the issue. Right, they're not going to take the time to have to go look up. It's like okay, let me let me stop trying to solve the issue and let go go figure out what's still up and what's not. Uh, right. And so, yeah, that makes that that gets uh, that gets right to the heart of the matter as far as communication. We talk when we uh, go out and talk to folks about incident response and, you know, the incident response process and talk about customer liaisons and business response mm -hmm. teams and things like that. It's like those people are the ones that would be like right in on that that status update because they can take that information. They don't have to bug the rest of the incident response team. They don't have to bug the incident commander. They can just look at that status updates or at those status updates and right. see like, okay, we can see that, you know, Kubernetes is up. This is up at that, this particular section still down. And so we'd have to uh, craft that message, you know, so that it can share it with the customers, let them know what's going on without, you know, telling them too much information. Right. But exactly. um, no, that's, uh, that's great. That'll, that'll definitely make their lives a lot uh just a lot less stressful and mm -hmm. uh yeah things just like what automation does makes things faster right, right. it makes things faster makes it so that they can get the information faster solve the issue faster and uh you know keep things running right right, right. major uh telecom provider I was talking to uh really latched onto that idea and for them it was can we can we refresh and update what is the uh number what are the number of customers impacted the, you know, Ooh. as as we're resolving the issue, uh, and, and we're kind of leveling out to normal traffic patterns, and uh, so for them that that really resonated because the the stakeholder might be the person that wants to get an update of you know how many how many customers are are seeing this um, deprecated user experience, for example, and so they want to be able to you know click on that every you know 10 minutes or so and and see that that number go from a few dozen down to you know a dozen down to six down to zero and uh again that that sort of thing might be visible on uh in a monitoring tool but the stakeholder doesn't know where to go in the monitoring tool and doesn't know which graph to look at and what to interpret but if it was just a a, a very clearly defined button uh mm -hmm. where where people are actually keeping track of the incident, like in Slack, for example, that that automation action could be invoked straight from Slack. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the fact that this is all piping to Slack, which is where everybody lives, yeah, and that's, exactly. right? That, that's where we all live. I, I don't even, I check Slack. If you want to get a hold of me, it's through Slack. It's emails. Right. I might get, I might see it once a week right? Uh, <laughs> as I'm telling the whole world this, but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Th that's, that's it. That's where we want to put information where people are. And, and that's where we, that's makes a lot of sense there. So, so Jake, how, how what, what do folks do next? How do they get started? We, we have those that we dropped a link to that solution guide that you were showing before. I think that is mm -hmm. super handy and helpful. Um, is, are there any other resources folks should check out? Uh, I think you had a uh, link up to a blog post that uh, digs into the triage use case a little bit more, uh, reiterates yeah. what we've been talking about here in, uh, in a fairly eloquent manner because uh, <laughs> it was written by someone in product marketing. And so they, they uh, know how to make things sound much, much more elegant than uh, I can. But uh, they have a talent they, for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, there's so in within the solution guide, uh, which outlines uh, how to hook up process automation to PagerDuty and and has these example jobs. Even for those using our 
open source product, uh, Run Deck Community. Mm -hmm. uh, they can download a template job from the, there's actually a couple of template jobs in the solution guide. Um, one for Kubernetes, one for services running on a, a Linux VM and can, can test out this concept uh, on their own without needing the, the commercial automation product. So uh, that's a nice way to get hands-on and get started without needing to go through a um, commercial product investigation. Yeah. So the solutions guides inside of uh, Rundeck community is, mm -hmm. is another good place to get some information. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we dropped links to uh, the blog post that you mentioned uh, to the triaging and that or automation beyond triaging. And then also to the, uh, solution overview for automated automated diagnostics made it almost exactly. all the way through the the, the show <laughs> without tripping over those words so uh but that's I, I think that's for me that's really helpful especially that area where it has that section talking about you know azure gcp mysql kubernetes and just what we recommend on places where for people to start i think that's gonna be super helpful for folks and for engineers who are in those situations yeah, we we hope so. And uh, like I said, we're. I think I mentioned this in the last uh, last Twitch stream or podcast that uh, we're still investing heavily in this area and and investigating more and more and finding uh, new use cases for diagnostics all the time. And so, my advice again would be to just you know stay tuned, keep your ears peeled. Uh, I, I referenced this uh, capturing a state use case. We're going to be developing more and more in that area as well. Cool. Which means Jake is going to be back on the show soon <laughs> to talk more about the new things that are that are coming down the pipe for for automated uh, diagnostics. So thanks. Thanks again, Jake, for joining us, for sharing this knowledge. And uh, we look forward to having you back on. I look forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. This is Scott McAllister, and I want to wish everyone here an uneventful rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Make sure you never miss a stream. Follow us at PD Community and PagerDuty on Twitch.tv. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you'd like to be on our stream, email us at community-team at pagerduty.com so we can feature the cool things you're doing. And don't forget, check out all of our global events on our calendar at pagerduty.com events.